Ask Oregonians what treaty is most important in our state, and you'll likely hear Douglas fir, or if you're east of the Cascades, Ponderosa pine. But if you drive east from Bend, you'll encounter a forest that covers more of the land in our state than either Douglas fir or Ponderosa pine, Western Juniper. Looking at the geologic clock, juniper is a relative newcomer to Oregon. 10,000 years ago, the northernmost boundary of juniper was almost 1,000 miles south of us. After the glaciers receded, western juniper slowly moved its way up into Oregon and arrived here about 6,000 years ago. I'm uh, fortunate to be standing in front of this magnificent uh, old growth tree and it's uh it's a, uh, it's a kind of tree which many of us in central Oregon uh, hold in very high regard. It's a magnificent resource. But uh, over the past hundred years, we have another kind of juniper tree that has greatly expanded, uh, particularly in, in central and eastern Oregon. And that's a kind of juniper tree that we call post-settlement juniper trees. Post-settlement juniper are maturing in incredible numbers and are slowly but surely changing the landscape. Since the late 1800s, we've seen a huge increase in juniper and the information would support that we believe that there's never been this dramatic or large of an increase. Well, I've been here since I was 15 and that's quite a while ago, but these trees weren't here at that time. It doesn't take them long to take over quite a chunk of country when they get going. A lot of the country you could trot right through it and with a horse and look all over, but now you can't even, you gotta lay on your back to look out. <laughs> Juniper is now spread throughout eastern and central Oregon, taking over nine million acres of rangeland. But what was once considered a rancher's problem now threatens to alter the ecology of this landscape, changing the basic processes that maintain this unique ecosystem the sagebrush biome. Juniper is a hardy plant. Their seeds are spread by birds and take hold quickly. At first, the young trees grow quietly amidst the grasses and shrubs. But after 50 years, they assert themselves and begin to dominate the understory. Before European American settlement, periodic wildfires played a very important role across this landscape and kept the young juniper in check. Juniper's been here forever, but juniper inhabited the, the rocky knolls where fire couldn't get to it. When we really started to see the proliferation of western juniper was when we started to control fire. Fires caused by lightning strikes and Native Americans killed the young juniper and enabled a flush of grasses and wildflowers. That disturbance is, is just part of the whole process of plant ecology and plant succession. And it can rejuvenate or regenerate systems. It creates a lot more uh, complexity across the landscape. We often think of disturbance as being negative, but fire was a natural process. It actually helped keep insects at bay sometimes from having large insect outbreaks. In the absence of disturbance, juniper trees will eventually dominate the sites. With the arrival of ranchers and farmers, major changes occurred that proved favorable to juniper expansion. 100 years ago or so, there was nobody putting out fires. If the lightning struck, well, it burnt till it got ready to go out, you know. Then all of a sudden, everybody got to protecting everything, and the minute the fire would start, somebody would run and put it out. Well, you know, these guys really got a head start. Young post-settlement juniper took advantage of these changes and began a quiet march into this new inviting territory. 
Well, western juniper is one of these species that sort of sneaks up on you. And, and by that I mean it's a, it's a pretty slow growing plant. Uh, the seedlings are small and they can stay small for a long time. It may take uh, 20 to 30 years for a juniper seedling to top the sagebrush canopy. So eventually, as this plant is sneaking up on us, it, uh, once it starts to dominate a site, we may, we may miss some of the early impacts, you know, because we're not watching as closely as we probably should be. But once those plants get more than eight feet tall and probably less than, oh, something like 40 feet apart, you really, really start to see a decrease in a lot of the associated species. On almost all the sites, we'll lose the sagebrush. Uh, bitterbrush, which is also a shrub species, may hang in there, but we often see low growth rates. The wildflowers typically decline pretty dramatically. And the grasses uh, may decline, and on deep soils, the grasses may hang in there. And so it just kind of depends on the kind of site. The impacts aren't uniform across all sites. You'll always lose your shrub layer, but you can maintain your, your grass layer if you have deep, loamy soils. But if you have some kind of a shallower soil or a restrictive clay layer or something about 18 inches below the surface, it will look like a moonscape underneath those trees, whether it's being grazed or not grazed. In a land with only 12 to 14 inches of annual precipitation, thirsty young junipers can be problematic. They really take off when they do decide to grow and they got to have water so you know you just imagine what one of those things drinks every day a lot of her and you get a millions of them and millions of them will there's a very little moisture left when they get through at the country the reason juniper has the the impact on other species that it does is it's so effective at extracting soil water this is the desert so water is very important juniper roots reach wide and deep and the heavy juniper canopy can prevent rain from ever reaching the ground. In times of high water flow, the juniper again assert themselves on the landscape. We can see a real negative impact on soil water relations, infiltration, to sediment loss or erosion. Every year we get two or three flash floods and because the junipers have taken the vegetation in some of the areas, because there's nothing to hold that water, um, we've actually lost a lot of soil off of our hillsides higher up because of the juniper encroachment. I've seen juniper areas where they're very thick with with a lot of overland flow from from precipitation that won't infiltrate and we get uh, sheet erosion, rill erosion and, and gully erosion which can add to sediment in our streams and uh, it's bad for the fish and, and everything else we do. The effects of juniper on the shrubs, grasses, and water table impacts cattle and wildlife, both large and small. In the early thinking of expansion of juniper, we, there were a number of people feeling that this was, was good for wildlife. And, and in early stages of encroachment, it can be beneficial to wildlife. But as juniper continues to increase, it dominates the site, we lose much of the structural complexity of the stands. We lose the shrub component, we can lose the herbaceous component, and so it can have a very significant impact. So it can actually, in the long run, have a negative effect on wildlife habitat. Some of our fields we had to abandon as far as putting cows in because there was no, no reason for a cow to be there. There was no grass under the juniper trees. We had a solid monoculture. And you would go into those places and there would be no Tweety birds, there would be no bugs, there would be no grasshoppers, there would be no, no cycle of life that we could see. Mm -hmm.